Hello and good morning. Good morning, Thinker. How are you guys doing this morning? Hopefully this Tuesday, April 11th, uh, finds you well and all that. Um, I made more changes to the stream this morning because it was looking a little bit, little bit wonky as far as the uh, frame rate and um, made some changes to help out the internet because I've been having some internet troubles as well. Um, so let me know if the sound is good, my audio versus the music, if one is uh, too loud, too soft, that kind of thing. Um, and I have the ability, hopefully this works, to actually mute the music if I wanted to actually speak without music. Or I could have the music on and then I can mute myself a lot easier now. Sound a little muted. Hmm. So which which part? The music is a little muted or my audio is it like me? Me or music? <laughs> Oh, the voice is muted. Interesting. Okay. Let me see if I can turn up the levels on it. Okay, how about now? And also keep in mind that your device, I mean, what volume is your device at as well? Because when I look at, yeah, I'm kind of, I'm, I have to actually speak into the mic while I'm looking at it. And when I look over there, I'm actually in the yellow as far as that's concerned. So it should be coming through pretty good as I play with the mic here. Uh, should be coming through, right? Um, but we'll see. I could point it directly at my head as well. That always helps. Let me know if that's better. Yeah, better? Okay, great, great. Yeah, I'd rather err on the side of being too loud than too soft, right? Uh, so that uh, individuals can turn their device down rather than having to crank it all the way up. Okay, um, the stream should see, seem a bit smoother now as well, especially when I put brush to canvas. So if I'm actually, you know, putting stuff on the canvas, which I'm going to start doing right now. Hopefully it looks a bit smoother. There's not a lot of lost frames, that, those kind of things. I was looking at it the other day. Actually, I was doing a recording for the color videos that I want to do and uh, it was not looking good and in the previous recordings that I'm editing right now I realized those aren't good as well so those are going to go out with some lost frames oh well and I will improve on the next ones okay gonna oil out this area to actually see what the real color is And how are you this morning, Thinker? How's the art going? Having any troubles? Still working on color? What are you working on? Do you have a specific painting that you're working on? Or drawing? Yeah, let me know. I'm interested. Are you painting your own tiger? <laughs> that would be great. Dueling tigers.
Also, uh, one thing I'm thinking about still, I haven't forgotten, is if you want to be on the stream regularly, we could set up something. I don't know how to do it. I'd have to figure it out. Where you could be on the stream. Instead of typing, we could just talk to each other. Uh, that would be kind of cool. You could be like a co-host. <laughs> Passing questions back and forth. If we establish something like that, we could get more people on. Not all at the same time. That could be kind of crazy to coordinate while I'm trying to paint. But... At least, you know, kind of guests that come on, guest artists. But shoot me an email. Actually, shoot me an email regardless, like a yes or a no. That would be good. Talking to you, Thinker. Because you've been here the longest, so we're going to start with you, if you're interested in it. And if you're not, that's cool. Oh, you're doing... Oh, hello, Finnish. Good morning. Or good afternoon. I'm doing a painting for the pollinating bee fundraiser oh fantastic that's right I remember you saying that now thanks for reminding me how's it going with the uh, pollinating bee and thinkers like oh gosh he wants to know detailed information that I have to type <laughs> what a pain darn it Chris asking me all these questions Okay, that section is foil, fully oiled out, although there's some that's a bit too thick. It's glaring way too much. You have to be careful with this refined linseed oil. When you put it on, it may look super thin, but then an hour or so later, you'll see these drips all over the place, usually down at the bottom, because it, it starts to kind of slide. So, um, one thing that I, I normally do, I haven't done in a while, that you take your paper towel and just kind of lightly go over the place that you oiled out. That'll pull off any extra to make sure that it doesn't uh, drip down your canvas at all. So looking at this area, um, looks like I pulled off some paint here while I was covering a darker spot. And for you guys, this looks like just nothing but black. But uh, for me, when I look at the reference, there's a lot more detail, kind of like you see in the reference here. There's all, all kinds of little details that are actually in there. Within the canvas, I'm not sure if you can see that. You can probably see some of these light things. You can see my ref the reflection of my hand that happens. You know, that's kind of, that reflection is kind of difficult to deal with, but um, all those details are kind of lost with the camera, I think, when it gets so dark. And, you know, I don't, more and more I dislike painting um, well, having a lot of dark areas on the canvas because it's really hard to deal with for the life of the painting, uh, especially if you have cats <laughs> because every little floating thing, hair included, dust, as soon as it hits this little, sp you know, these darker spots, it's just like little points of... Um, annoyance you know it, it's never going to be perfectly smooth uh, I bet you curators at um, museums and things like that have a, a big trouble of a time trying to keep the dust off of paintings it's a small 8x10 painting three bees one main bee flying a third of the way over I'm happy with it so far awesome that's really good are you posting it on Instagram, the progress? Because I'd like to see that. That would be pretty cool. We all would like to see it. Post your, put, put a link to your Instagram profile here if it is. Or if it's not, go ahead and put your profile. Share with people, please. I need burnt, burnt umber out here.
Okay. Color. So yesterday, I decided to change up how I organize my palette for a really good reason. Or at least I feel it's a good reason. Of course, it may change in the future. We'll see. Everything is about experimentation, you know, trying out new things, uh, getting better, see if they work. Uh, no, not on Instagram yet. Great. Good. Well, I'll wait to see it. That would be great. So I changed up my palette so that it's, it's going to be organized more in a color wheel sort of way. Um, and still, still figuring that out to how I can exactly do that. And yesterday you asked a really good question, Thinker, about why is white blue? And I had this very rambling explanation for it. Anytime I ramble on like that, it's an indication that I don't know why. I don't know why um, as well as I should, basically. As well as I would like to. I hate using that word, should. Um, which is fine. It's a great indication that I, I need to get a better understanding of why white is kind of blue. But then I was thinking about it. You know, if you look at how the Munsell system treats white, black, and grays, they really separated out, or at least Munsell has separated the, your neutral colors away from everything else. And even though you can talk about light in general, how light reacts and Kelvin, uh, or color temperature, it doesn't mean that it's the same thing. The same thing happens with paint. Paint reacts very differently. So what I'm thinking about doing is setting up my palette so that white and black, because I'm going to be adding black to my palette again, or maybe for the first time, I'm not sure. I'm thinking about separating those out just like the Munsell system would. Where I have a color wheel of colors and then on the side or the bottom somewhere on my palette would be a white and a black and maybe some grays. or just a white and black because we can make up all the grays we want with those two colors, you know. Uh, the only reason to have the grays on your palette would be for convenience. Honestly, I mean, that's, that's true with every color that is not the major primaries. The red, blue, yellow, RBY, RYB, Anything else but those are convenience colors. Where, you know, if you have an orange on there, you have it so you don't have to continually mix up red and yellow to make an orange. You're kind of already there. How's your color mixing video coming along? Uh, very slow. I recorded probably about an hour of the video and then afterwards thought about it and said I'm going to redo it. Um, and I quickly realized that it needs to be a series of videos, not just one, because of all the complexities. It's not, it's not that it can't be simplified. The most important thing at the very beginning, the foundational element for color theory, for understanding color, is having a common language surrounding color. And I want to establish that first. So that's going to be the first video where it's, it's uh, action oriented, practical, but it's more of a discussion on the terms. But through the videos, because I, I learn visually and I learn when I do. I think many people learn that way. They learn better when they're actually doing things. 
for example, you could study all the painting books out there and still not know how to paint. They, to learn how to paint, you gotta paint. Painters gotta paint, right? Artists, you have to do. Uh, just listening to me talk about the primaries, why they're the primaries, secondaries, why they're second, why they are secondaries, tertiaries. What's the difference between shade, tint, and tone? You know the the three major aspects of color: chroma, hue, value. You can listen to it all day, but uh, practicing it is, is where you really get a better understanding of everything. So that's that's kind of where it's at. Um, this should go pretty quickly. I'm looking at this tree over here, and it's it's very. I'm you know I'm looking I'm I'm actually looking at the reference too. If I look at the full reference, or if we look at the full reference, there's a lot of scribbles over on the far right. Um, and I may add a little bit of that, but uh, I think for the most part on the painting itself, I'm going to keep it very subdued, not, not as much as even is in the digital version. I do need to separate out this tail from the background a bit more. You can see that dark color that I added there. And I want something back here, something, you know, that looks like shapes of leaves and trees. Maybe definitely separate the edges of this palm frond out. Will you need to practice with black on your palette first? Yes, actually, uh, the very first thing that we're going to be doing, because as I make these videos, I'm going to be learning a lot as well. So I learn it and then I teach it several times. That's why the first video, I, I recorded a first video and I'm like, okay, that's good for me. I kind of know it a little bit better. Um, then I'll record it again, maybe a third time. And then when I feel like I know it well enough, then I'll record the final video. There's one, th you know, to be able, okay, let me get my language right here. Knowing how to paint, how, you know, to be, to draw, to be an artist, you know, to, to do it well and to teach it are two completely different things. Um, you know, knowing what you're doing helps, but there's a lot of fantastic artists out there that can't teach very well. And there's a lot of not so great artists that can teach fantastically. There's a lot of great artists out there that can teach well as well. I would like to be in the latter boat where I can I can do it well and I can teach it well. That's where I would like to end up. But it, it's going to take practice. So all that to say, the very first color wheel that we're going to be doing, oh, let me, I can show you. Well, I, I erased the first one. I can show you kind of a, a precursor to what we're looking at. Let me go to the canvas so you can see this whole thing. So this is what I'm creating. Um, we're gonna do shades, tints, and tones. And these are gonna be small color wheels. Sorry, it's kind of blown out because I have to lighten it up for our painting. And it's hard um, with this lens. I can't easily change the ISO. Let me see. There you go. So eventually, I'm going to have to actually paint over this. We're going to take 
this color wheel and we're gonna divide it into 12 different colors. At first I was gonna go with like nine or five, you know, a small color wheel, but um, I wanted to be able to exhaust the amount of colors uh, that we can use on our palette. Exhaust as in trying to mix up as many colors as we can to get an understanding of what our palettes can do. And shade is going to take all 12 colors and then mix them to the center, which will be black. So you'll get an understanding of all these colors that you have and how they look when they go to black. And it'll be just five steps. So the right out of the tube, black will be two and then three in between. And then we're going to do tense, which will be the same thing, but then the center will be white. And then we'll do tones, which will be all the same colors and the center will be gray. Um, with that, uh, and there's, there's small, it's a small color wheel. So with that, I'm almost positive as I need to brighten this up again. There we go. By doing that, I'm, I'm positive that we, we will get a deep understanding of everything that our colors can do. And I think that's the next step. The first step is understanding the terms so we have a common language to speak about color. Because if I'm talking about saturation or chroma or purity or intensity, uh, and you don't know that all that means chroma, you know, I, and I'll, I'll probably change my language so I only use chroma within it, right? or pick one and use it. Um, but if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's hard for me to teach anything. So the, the beginning portion, I think, is really important uh, with the terms. And also to, to kind of get it straight for myself as well. I tend to reference, I say color a lot. And when you're teaching a video about you know, the major aspects of color. You can't just say color because there's a whole tremendous amount of information within that one word. Also, the ability to describe it yourself is really important. Will there be a vocabulary test? <laughs> I'll probably have a download though. That would be kind of cool. Something that people can download and reference really easily. Something that is visual. Because, um, you know, I learn vi visually. But probably the most important reason uh, for learning this vocab, right? The language behind it. Is so when you look at a color on this canvas, or you look at a color in life, like an apple or a picture or something like that, you can explain all the aspects of that color. You could say, uh, these greens here are a tint of green. The hue is green, has a tendency towards green, that has been tinted, and it has a very low chroma and low saturation. Within that, with just knowing that, being able to describe it in language, I have a much better chance of actually mixing it on my palette. And I think, well, I know, I, I know that that is really important. So Andrew Tischler has this color mixing exercise where you try to match the color of the paint swatches. Very helpful exercise and helped me understand the range of my palette. Yeah, that, you know, that's part of it. Um, you know, the action of matching, you know, I want to paint this, how can I match that? And that'll be part of it, but we very rarely, I, th I think that's like kind of step one, you know, as far as your practice for matching colors. Um, and it's really good starting step, I believe, because you have this isolated color and you can match that isolated color and just kind of get an understanding of how to work the paint, how to mix the paint. Um, and I really like that. 
The next step of, of that process is to look at a photograph or a digital screen or an apple in real life or your hand, you know, and try to match something there. You get into all kinds of different concerns within that. I, I, did, a, I did a bunch of research on um, Draw Mix Paint, Mark Carter. He, did, he has done several color videos over the years and he's gotten better at actually teaching it. And you know, it's one of those things where you do it the first time and people are like asking all these questions, right? And then you do another video, you answer all the questions and you explain the, the whole thing a bit better. But what I learned from looking at all the comments there and all the questions was um, that he was, and in one of them, he was matching a still life, you know, something on a still life. And the most predominant question was, hey, where do I buy that color checker? Because he has this thing that you hold out um, and you put, you put some paint on it and then you hold it out and then you, you look at that over your still life. It was, it's a interesting way to compare what you've mixed, you know, to get that feedback. And it isn't that people really wanted the color checker. What, what they really wanted, well, they wanted the color checker, but what they really needed was feedback on, is the color that I'm mixing correct? So I, I have some options for that as well. Of course, I work digitally. This is digital to traditional. There's not going to be a still life set up here. It's not going to be part of a um, landscape painting or anything like that. We're not going to be outdoors. It's, it's going to be dealing with photographs and two-dimensional you know, imagery. I have to pick my audience. I can't provide solutions for every single person on the planet, unfortunately. Maybe in the future, uh, if I have enough videos out there. <laughs> Never know, I might be doing landscapes in the future. Buying one of Mark, Col Mark Carter's uh, color checkers. All right, I'm gonna... I'm going to step back. Uh, you know, all I did here was kind of darken up some areas, kind of change up some of the texture a little bit. Um, actually, I want, I want some of this, the black of the tail to kind of fade into the background. So removing some of those edges, I'm actually going to glaze over the bottom of this tail and really get it to fade back there. So I want to see what this looks like when I step back first. Yeah, honestly, it doesn't need to be more detailed than that. I don't need to work it up any further. This is background element. It's getting really far away from our focal point. I don't need to uh, work that any, any longer. And I need to practice that more. You know, what can I let go of? Where do I not need all that detail? What is good enough? A little peephole with uh, my fingers and use it as a color isolator. Yeah, that's the kind of thing that I'm gonna be using. I think I showed it once before on here. I have to find it. I got this idea from Paul Foxton who also does a lot of stuff on color. Um, 
I need to clean this up. It's got stuff all over it. Hmm. I guess I didn't clean this uh, well after the last time I used it. Sorry, I'm trying to clean up this little piece of plastic that I have that I want to show you. So, we all buy all kinds of plastic tops and things. And there's a lot of them that you can get that are super clear. Of course, this one's kind of dirty right now, so it's not super clear. Uh, for the most part, it's very clear. I'd probably get a new one. Um, I could wash it up and it would be really clear. Uh, but this is just a plastic top that I cut up. And, you know, what I will do is put like a bit of paint on the edge of it, get it real flat. And then I have this black uh, piece of cardboard. Actually, when I bought my other microphone, um, it had all this black um, cardboard with it. And you can isolate that way and check. It works really well with something that you can, like, this paint is dry, so I could put this right up against it, you know, just like that. But if the paint is wet, you know, you really have to kind of hover over the top so you don't mess up anything in the bottom. But this is a good way to isolate the color as well if you're... But as you can see, you, it depends on where the light's coming from. So there's a, there's a lot that goes into it. So if I try to do it here, I've done shadowed, you know, what's behind it. So I'm not going to isolate well, so I have to do it this way. You know, kind of check in that way. But that's checking with the painting. Um, probably more importantly would be, you know, if I have my iPad over here and my image is up there, being able to check with the iPad. And because the iPad and these digital screens are backlit, it's a lot easier to do this because you don't have to worry about the shadow that you cast. It's still gonna be there. Of course, there's a lot of concerns that go into that, you know, how bright is your screen, you know, all kinds of things. The easiest is just getting a photo, but, well, as far as color checking, getting a photo. I'm doing it off a photo, laminating a photo, but I'm not going to do all that. I want to try and keep it as accessible as possible as well. Okay, <clears throat> for, th for this painting, I'm going to move down to the bottom palm front. As I, that's as far up as the painting will go, so I need to adjust my camera down. And we're gonna oil out some more. This whole corner, this whole thing, I'm gonna oil out the whole thing. I really don't wanna do a lot of work on this palm frond. I will ha have to over here to get it to blend better with um, what I've already gone over because I was moving a lot of dark colors over it to prepare for how the leg, the leg is gonna look behind there. But for the most part, I want to just darken this up. I mean, if you look at the reference, I mean, look how dark um, that palm front is over there. It's very different. Oh, if you can look at the reference there, probably better, and see a comparative. It's so much different than what I have. It's a lot brighter on the canvas right now. And I'm going to glaze it down a lot. It's a nice palm frond, but it's distracting. It's um, it's one of those things. Uh, it's kind of like what Stephen King says in his book on writing. It's a great book for creators, by the way, not just writers, but for artists as well. He says, "Kill your darlings." <laughs> of course, you know Stephen King would, you know, use language like that, right? <laughs> Um, but you know, I could love this palm frond. Like, oh, I had so much fun like working on this palm frond. But that's not my center of interest. This, this painting is not about. It's about perseverance, not this darn palm frond. Right? 
So the purpose of this palm frond is to be uh, background stuff to provide a setting for this tiger, but not to take over the interest whatsoever. So I'm gonna be taking this way down. Like all this dark area down here at the bottom, it's, it's gonna be as dark as I can get it. Just black, just background, noise, nothing. It's not important. Good morning, Ashton. It's, it's funny, like if you look, if you go to the museum or if you look online, um, you know, look at some of the greatest paintings in the world or in history. They, you'll be amazed at how simple they are. You know, it's just a portrait and the rest of the entire painting is just this kind of smoky background with nothing in it. Of course, some of them are really complex and every inch of them has something going on with them. So there you go. I think the better paintings are the ones that have, you know, a purpose behind them, a center of interest. Oh no, laptop stopped working so you can't do digital art. Oh man, hopefully you can get it fixed. Or buy a new one that's not so expensive. That sucks, I'm sorry. All right, let's go for it. Let's push this palm frond back. Up, super upset me yesterday. I really wanted to throw something across the room. <laughs> yeah, I could see that. It's like, oh, I want to do my artwork on my time off from school, but I can't. Well, you, you got that sculpture, so at least you have that. But I, I still understand. So you're motivated to do this. And as soon as something gets in the way of that, it's, it, it is upsetting. Okay, that's way too much oil on here. I'm gonna take most of this off, or a lot of it. The paint was just getting on there just way too thin. Now when you oil out on your painting and you put a lot of oil on there, you can use that as glazing as well. I mean, you could, you could glaze with linseed oil, no problem. Really gonna darken this up right now. Gonna try and go a bit too far with it at the beginning. Any inconvenience to my plans drive me crazy, so today I'll just try to stay calm and watch movies. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, do what you can. Um, I totally understand that. If I have plans to do something and, you know, they get kind of derailed, it is really upsetting. I've had to... Well, it, it doesn't work a lot of the times. So I'm still, I still struggle with being able to pivot and say, okay, can't do that. What can I do? Yeah. But I feel you. I feel you, Ashton. Okay. Very dark there.
Now what you can do is, because this palm frond back here is pretty light, and all these palm fronds are light, I glazed over it really darkly. Uh, really dark. So just darken down the whole thing. And now I'm doing kind of a pick out, where I'll pull out as much of this paint out of my brush as I can, get it as dry as I can. And then you can kind of lightly go in there, pull off some of that glaze to bring back some of the value. I'm also going to get out my um, the brush that I use for uh, what's the word? I woke up way too early today, so my brain is struggling to find words sometimes. Um, to blur out uh, lines and things like that, to get rid of edges. This this brush, my blurring brush, softening brush, blending brush. There you go. I'm not really blending though. Well, I guess I am. Yeah, it's kind of like a blend. Getting rid of a lot of those brush strokes that are part of this glaze. Let me zoom in a bit so you can see what I'm doing. Yeah, that's really nice. See how far that's pushed back now? Let me zoom out. The, the, the distance between, I mean, these are basically on the same plane. They're in front of the tail, but because I've darkened that up, it's really pushed back there. That part of the palm frond looks like, you know, feet away. You know, much much further away than it was before, and that's what I wanted to do. Push it back, get rid of it, make it less important. Uh, the orange on the fronds, honestly, they could be a reflection, especially, well, kind of. I don't think it would reflect that much in reality, but you can do that. I mean, we're painting. I could do whatever the hell I want, but um, mainly it was for when we were looking at palm fronds, a lot of them were kind of dead. Um, and they had this kind of interesting change in hue because some of the leaves were dying. So they would go to this kind of brownish orange and we added a lot of that into the digital version. bringing out some of the texture that I had within these little bits of the palm frond. And I need to make a clear separation between the, the tail here and this palm frond. So I'm going to make sure that that is, has the correct value and edges that I want. That, those sections I, I'm done with. Maybe add a little bit more of an indication that these are leaves here. But yeah, that's fine. As I keep working. That's fine. Okay, that's enough, Chris. Stop it. Let's do the same to this one. 
probably make it a little bit lighter and make sure that these highlights really stand out. The, the highlights on these, these palm fronds, I believe, give, it, give them real form and depth, real believability. I, yeah, it's a small thing, but makes the plants look more interesting. Yes, I agree. You know, that bit of oranges and things in there. I mean, I'm glad you said that so I don't forget about it. I'll keep them in there. I don't remember if this was intentional. It might have been that I made these palm fronds a bit too light. Um, when you're glazing, and I'm, re I'm repeating this, I know I said it before, but when you're doing glazes, it's better to glaze on a lighter background than a darker background. So the reason for that is, is because you want to use as pure a color, I'm sorry, as high a chroma color as you can, but as much as saturated as you can get. If you begin glazing with white, your painting quickly becomes um, hazy. So you start out with a lighter color something closer to white and then add more intensity more chroma to that with glazes and it always works out better that way you know back at the beginning of oil painting that's what they did they would just do glazes all the time to get their color uh, and to get these really rich blues and reds they would start on white But did the, uh, the, the artist at that time would not add white continually. It would just be kind of like watercolor, working from light to dark. Actually, in this instance, it's very similar to, to watercolor because you want to work from light to dark. It's how watercolor can get so bright, so intense, more intense than oil painting in a lot of ways. So if you wanted to reach really high intensity, high chroma in oil paint, the best thing to do is to start out on white or a very light value and then glaze over it uh, with intense color. All right, let's move on to this section here now. And if you see on my palette, I, you know, I haven't, I haven't mixed up a lot of different colors. This has been my darkest dark that I make, which is blue, or my ultramarine blue, burnt umber, and sap green. I only added sap green to it because we're in a green area. And then. I added down here is a little bit of white and uh, maybe a tiny bit of uh, Hansa yellow medium. And that's it. That's all I've been using for these glazes. I mean, I, I got my light area done 
uh, the lighter portion and I'm really using that. This would not work well if I didn't build up a good um, initial layer as well. You know, the more work you do on the initial layer, the glazing just becomes easier and easier. If you can see that maybe you can yeah you can see it so I put this glaze over this area and you can see like all these crazy brush strokes that I made because the glaze is thicker in some places than others and the brush the bristles of the brush is creating that which could be a really good effect for certain aspects of a painting depending on what you're trying to do but I don't want that here I just want to enhance what's beneath, change the values up, blend some things down. So this is the, the real reason why I'm pulling in this really soft blender brush. Get rid of all those strokes that I don't want. Really kind of soften it out. And then I can bring in the strokes that I want, if I want any more, um, carefully and exactly. So the medium, medium that I have on my palette is the um, Gamblin's uh, Solvent Free Gel Medium. I use the gel because I have a vertical palette and it's just easier to put on the palette. It'll sit there and not uh, flow away. There's also the solvent-free uh, fluid medium. It's, it's, it's just as good. You can also use uh, refined linseed oil. I mean, just this is what is in, is made up, the paint's made up mo mostly um, linseed oil. You could use that as glazing. So either one of those. I would suggest uh, staying away from anything that has a lot of solvents in it. But I'm, you know, that's kind of one of my things on YouTube. A part of my shtick on YouTube is showing people, how, you know, that, hey, you don't need solvents to complete amazing paintings or to do oil paint. You don't need them at all. I, I don't use them. And yet you'll go to a university and they'll say, no, you need to have solvents to begin your drawing and all that. No, you don't. Nope, you really don't. Because you don't have to draw with a brush. You can draw with uh, charcoal or graphite and it's more accurate that way. Huh. Let me zoom out again. And I guess the argument there is, well, you know, it's, I enjoy drawing with a brush. That's fine. I mean, you, you can, it's up to you to use solvents, but if you're in a tiny room like I am, well, it's not a really tiny room, but if you have to paint in a room that um, doesn't have ventilation, you know, how important is that painting versus the health of your lungs or um, all of the other parts of your body that are that uh, get affected by the fumes of solvents so uh, <clears throat> like one of the videos I have is you know finding your balance if you must use solvents to paint with then find the best balance that uh, is healthy for you while at the same time being able to complete the paintings you need to complete or want to complete.
find that healthy balance. It's like a balanced diet, right? <laughs> I mean, nuts are good for you. Nuts are a good, you know, source of protein. But I could eat a whole frickin' bucket of nuts right in front of me. At that, that amount, it's not so good. Like, if you're a landscape painter and you're outside every day doing uh, landscape paintings, yeah, use the solvents. Not a big deal out there. As long as you don't get them all over you, I mean, <laughs> you know, that, that's fine. Okay, I need some better separation between these leaves. I used to use solvents to draw with my paint, but the smell upsets my stomach. And now I just linseed oil to thin the paint and use it to draw. Yeah, I mean, solvents are really bad for you. Um, you can get Gamsol, you can get odorless mineral spirits, but just because you can't smell it doesn't mean it's not slowly killing you, you know, or hurting you in some way. Uh, you can check out the comments on my non-toxic oil painting video. I've had multiple people tell me about some horrific things that has that they have run into with solvents. There was one guy that said, yeah, um, I use solvents and I guess he got it all over his hands or something like that, but um, his hands started cracking open and bleeding. It's like, oh my God. And solvents are meant to take fat, fatty like particles, right? and break the mo molecules down. Actually separate the molecules away from each other. Rip them apart, basically. Your body has a lot of those fats in it, those oils. Um, and you breathe it in, it goes in through your nose, into your lungs, uh, into all these very sensitive things in your lungs and begins breaking stuff down. Uh, along the way, it hits all kinds of stuff. And then, uh, you know, most of your brain is made up of fat. Does it eventually hit your brain? I'm not sure, but, you know, I don't want... I mean, it's hard enough for me to think sometimes. I don't want to <laughs> kill what little brains I have. Uh, with solvents. I want to keep people painting for the rest of their lives. And I want it to be long, healthy lives as well. So, you don't need solvents. The bigger question that I got all the time with solvents was all about fat over lean. Um, and this is why many people use solvents to draw with, is because it's very lean paint. You can draw with it, and then everything you do after that will have um, flexible layers, basically. It will keep with the flexibility of the layers. Uh, the One of the latest videos that I did on, you know, non-toxic oil painting, or fat over lean without solvents, 
uh, I talked about how it's on a spectrum. So lean paint is on one side, you know, it's, it's all with solvents. And then fat paint is on the other side, which has a ton of medium in it, okay? And when we say, when we're talking about that type of medium, it's something like linseed oil, you know, things with fat in them. And then somewhere in between, you got paint right out of the tube. So if you wanted to practice fat or ever lean, you could start anywhere on that spectrum. You could start with paint right out of the tube like I do, and then work up from there and you still have fat over lean. You could start out with a very minimal amount of oil. So just a little bit of fat and then just increase o over time. And you'd still follow fat over lean. Probably um, if you're worried about your paintings falling apart within the next, you know, 70 or 80, 80 years uh, finish, and this is what we're talking about. We're not talking about within a year or two. You know, if you do fat over lean wrong, you'll see a problem. The, the paintings will have problems after you're dead, basically, <laughs> for the most part. But if you're, if you want to draw out um, at the beginning, I would suggest using like a galkid or an alkid medium. This is galkid light, which is a very fluid medium. Uh, and a new thing is, is alkids and you can thin out your paint at the beginning and the alkids get them, you know, basically allows that paint to dry really quickly. You know, the, the main purpose of fat over lean painting is you set up your layers so that the first layers dry faster than your subsequent layers of paint. And when you're glazing like I am, that's important. If you're working a la prima, not so important because you're mixing everything together. But that's that's it. You just want the under layers to dry faster than your uh, layers after that. So you could still use um, oil throughout your entire process if, let's say, you do a layer of paint and then you let it dry for three or four days and then it's dried to the touch it's you know a thin layer then you start painting your next layers still gonna be fine for painting because you know you've kept that uh, dry time you know your under layers are gonna dry just as you know fast enough or faster than your uh, layers over top so there's so many ways around it it's just uh, I think I think what it is is many people are getting into oil painting and they just don't know and they hear you know, oh no you have to start out with solvents you have to do it this way it's like no 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 you you don't um, you really don't depends on what you're doing it really does I like your approach of keeping your brushes in an oil container, but what do you do when you need a clean, dry brush? Um, hmm. Let me ask you the question. When would you need a clean, dry brush? Like, perfectly clean. Like, I, well, I guess, uh, let, let me uh, make that, a bit, that question a bit more specific, sorry. Um, are you talking about when you're changing color? Let's say that, you know, I, I'm working with all these dark colors right now and I want to go to a, a very light color. Is that where you want to have a very clean brush? Maybe I could just go over them instead of being annoying with questions. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, so th there's, there's several aspects of this, and I'll go over them real quick before we end the stream. 
Um, but I want to get this one palm frond leaf in. Right there, just very lightly an indication that it's over the leg. And this one too. And a continuation of it right here. Very subtle. Okay, let's talk about brushes. So in my brush bath, I still have a bunch of brushes. Let me get another one out, okay? It's got a bunch of oil in it. So the first thing I'm doing, which you can't see this, but I just press this brush against the side of the container and it had clean oil in it, so it's not a big deal. And then I'll go to a, let me get a clean paper towel and I'll, I'll clean it out even more. As you can see, there is a little bit of color in there, okay? Just a tiny bit of color, mostly oil. Let me do it a couple times. Still got, you know, some little residue in there. Not much at all. Really not much at all, okay? I would consider this a perfectly clean dry brush. Um, well, actually, you really, with oil painting, you don't need anything perfectly dry, like bone dry. If you wanted it bone dry, just get, you know, have a stack of brushes that aren't in your, um, in your soak and use one of those and then kind of add it to it. Um, or you can clean your brushes with soap every day if you wanted to. That's kind of a waste of time in my opinion. But that little amount of paint is not gonna make any issue or make any problem. I'm gonna go right into white. This would be the color that it would affect most. Perfectly white still. And if I was if I was still afraid of it, like no, I wanted even more pure white. Here's what I would do. I'll get a bunch of this white and I'll smush it all into the brush. Really get it in there. Maybe even add a little bit of medium with it if I wanted to. You know, get it all in there. And then I'm gonna smush all of that out into my paper towel. Oops. And now we have a brush that's like full of white. This is my light brush now. Just as fine, just as good. The difference between those two colors, eh, next to nothing, really. That subtle difference is not a big deal, if anything. But there you go, now I got perfect white. I never need to have brushes that are so perfectly clean, honestly. Let's go a little bit more extreme. So I've been working with dark colors in this brush the whole time, very dark. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna dip right back into all this really black color, okay? <laughs> smush, yeah, smush it out. And so I have a very dirty brush, brush with black, and I want to use this brush with pure white now. So what do I do? Do I go clean it out in my brush washer? I could, I could do that. A quicker way of doing it is just the exact same thing I did before. Let's get it, let's smush it out on, in my paper towel as much as I can. Doing this several times. And you can see, you know, all the paints here and the more I smush it out, the less paint that happens, you know? And it's very dry too, it's, it doesn't have much oil in it either. But I want to go full white, so I'm just going to pick up a bunch of white. Smush that all around into my brush. Now it's mixing with what is left in that brush, which now it's like a kind of really light greenish gray, okay? And then we'll pull all of that color out. Maybe I have to do this a second time. Maybe not, that's pretty darn white. Yeah, that's there. Let's one more time. Maybe there's some differences between those two, but not much at all, honestly. Um, 
yeah, maybe an easier way to get there is to have, you know, the smaller brush washer like I have. I, you know, one of my last shorts I did finish, um, I show the small brush washer plus the big brush soak that I use and how I use those interchangeably. Um, so this small brush washer, I'll bring this over because I can move it around no problem. I think you can see that. Yeah. So this just has uh, safflower oil in it. And if I really wanted to clean this brush up, this is not solvent, by the way. Never do this if it's solvent. I used to do it for years. Just have an open container of solvent, clean my brush out every time. Yeah, if you want to have uh, health problems later on in life, have solvent cans open and keep using them every day. Not so good. There's another way of doing it. You know, now this brush is pretty darn clean. And I can go right into white with that, if you want to use it that way. And look, if I put this over here, it's the same exact white. I, I didn't affect, the, either way of doing it, it depends on the way you, you want to do it. But no solvents needed, no long-term cleaning process, same brush, simple and easy. I had to go from the darkest dark to the lightest light. Uh, no big deal. And that's how I do it. Uh, whatever's easiest for you, but just don't have a can of solvents sitting there and like I did when I was an idiot 20 years ago. And every time I wanted to change a color, I would swoosh it out in my um, solvent container. You know, because all that would do is just stir up all those solvents. It would go right up into your nose and everything. And even when I was outside painting, not so good. Because I was always sitting down and my palette and everything was like right below me. It was like terrible. Yeah. So not so good on that. Um, yeah, let me go back to the painting. So, I've darkened up the back area, back here, and some of that. And you can see how bright this is comparatively. Let me go way back. Yeah, that, that needs to come down a lot. And what you're seeing looks a lot darker than what's actually on the painting. So this is going to come down even more tomorrow in value. I'm really going to take those values down. And I see a lot of haze back here as, too, as well. So I'm going to be getting rid of all that haze. The haze meaning um, I did some kind of glaze of white over some areas because I was, I remember I was painting some of this palm frond and I wanted to soften out a lot of the edges. And when I was doing that, it pulled uh, a lot of that palm frond into the background, which is black. And so there's some haze going on there. And every time I put my hand here, look at that. It's really hard to understand the value in color with reflection. That's another reason why I'm, I'm kind of annoyed at doing dark paintings is because the reflection is so hard to deal with. Um, but that's, you know, that's part of oil painting. It's actually part of acrylic painting as well. They have a lot of, uh, it has a lot of reflection to it, so things to have fun with. All right, guys, thanks so much for joining me on the live stream today. This was, what, 90? What are we at? Yeah, 90. We're gonna be hitting triple digits soon next week on this live stream. I hope to have this painting done before then and we can start on something new and different. Uh, what I've mostly learned from this painting is that I take too long to paint and I need to increase that. So we're going to work on that together and hopefully we'll um, come up with some solutions. But I'm pretty sure that this painting will be, will be done pretty soon. Okay. Thanks again for joining me. Oh, thanks for the demonstration finish says. Hey, thanks guys. And uh, you have a wonderful rest of your day and I will see you tomorrow.